Man, I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord today. If you are too, say, yes, I am. Well, we are in week two of a series called Blueprint, the Spirit-Filled Church. Blueprint, the Spirit-Filled Church. We believe that in the Bible, we see a blueprint for how we are to live our lives, for how we are to operate as a church in this day and age. And Acts, the book of Acts, is a blueprint uh, for how that is to be followed. Can I tell you this? The plan that God had for his people back then is still the plan now. His plan for the church then is his plan for the church right now. God has not changed his mind. Somebody say amen to that. I don't read in the Bible anywhere where God's like, oh, man, never mind. God has not changed his mind. His plan was to send the Holy Spirit to fill the church. We defined this last week. To fill the church and baptize the believer in order to empower them with spiritual gifts, to convict them of sin, to counsel them, guide them, and to unite the church. That was something that Jesus told them. I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. The Holy Spirit has to come, and if you guys keep holding on to me, I can't send him. The Holy Spirit will come once I leave. And then he tells his followers and tells me and you this in John 14, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. How many would say our culture needs some truth right now? Anybody? This world can't receive him because they're they're not even looking for him and they don't even know what he looks like. But you know the Holy Spirit because he's with you now, but later will be in you. And this is the verse where we see that when we receive salvation in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is with us, but he has not yet completely consumed you. That is a later experience. So for some of you that may be a little bit confused about that from a previous spiritual uh, place we came from, a previous church you were in, or something granddaddy told you, I'm just giving it to you right now. We don't receive the entirety of what the Holy Spirit is doing because he's not yet in us. Jesus is in us at salvation. The Holy Spirit is now with you. But there is a second experience, and we see that all throughout the book of Acts. When we see the word advocate, we're seeing the word parakletos. The paraclete means he's directly next to you, directly alongside you. Jesus Christ, even though God in flesh, was not omnipresent. He could not be everywhere all the time. He was a man. He was in flesh. He could not be everywhere all the time. And he said, if you're going to receive everything from God that he has for you, I have to leave, and someone who is omnipresent will be coming to you. Anybody glad for that? He will be coming to be around you. He is sent alongside of us. The Holy Spirit is sent alongside to be our wise counselor, our peaceful helper, our joyful encourager, our truthful guide, and the giver of spiritual gifts and empowerment. Somebody say a big amen to that paragraph, that sin. I mean, come on, that is the real deal. He is sent right next to you. Some of us, were going through something. We need wise counsel. Google doesn't have it, by the way, ever. You ever gone to WebMD and you had a headache, and now you think you've got some terminal illness from Zimbabwe? Wise counselor, we need wise counsel. Sometimes we just need some help, and we don't need it to be crazy. We need some peaceful help. You ever had somebody try to help you, and they make it worse? Holy Spirit will never do that. We need somebody to encourage us and fill us with joy. We need, we need a guide, and we need truth, and we need the spiritual gifts that he has. Today, I want to talk to you about a pretty important subject, and I want to introduce you to the first part in the Bible where we see the Holy Spirit come down to humanity. We see what he does. We see what happens. We see people's reaction. And until this time, uh, Jesus didn't travel very far from his hometown, by the way. He pretty much traveled like from here to maybe Waco in a circle. He never really left his region. 
It was kind of hard to get places back then. Didn't really leave very far. So it wasn't like a worldwide ministry until... He left and sent the Holy Spirit. That's when we see thousands and thousands and thousands being saved every single day. I want to introduce you to my best friend, the Holy Spirit. I want to introduce you to the one who has never left my side. I want to introduce you to the one that Jesus called a better advocate. Isn't it crazy that Jesus said, there's something better than me? I mean, if I was Jesus, I'd be like, this is the best it's ever going to get for you. I rose from the dead. But he said there's a better helper, a better advocate. And isn't it just like the devil to confuse and make weird the best thing heaven ever gave you next to Jesus? To confuse and for us to go around theological circles trying to overthink God and his very simple gift. The Holy Spirit given to humanity was not a confusing gift thing. It's very simple to understand, but it has gotten confusing. So I want to help simplify it today. And the sermon title is it, you probably think, well, this is not sounding simple, but it's going to help you in a minute. Today, I want to talk to you about Pentecost and Python. I want to talk to you about the thing that chokes you out and the thing that's meant to give you life and how they're constantly at war. And there's a lot of things that will choke things out Take your breath away and not in a good way. So God, I pray that my, my words be yours. That it's not, not me. God, when I read your word, the people that you sent to this church today, that you would plant that seed in their heart in a, in a powerful way. In Jesus' name. Acts 2, verse 1. On the day of Pentecost... All the believers were meeting together in one place. And suddenly there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm. And it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared in the room and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. At that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. And when they heard the loud noise, everyone came running. I love that part. Because real moves of God will receive people's genuine attention. They were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers, and they were completely amazed. How can this be, they exclaimed. These people are all from Galilee, yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages, and here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphia, Egypt, Libya, Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Cretans, Arabs. And we all hear these people speaking in our own languages the wonderful things God has done. And they stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they asked each other. You know, when the Holy Spirit shows up, Churches will try to dumb it down so people aren't bewildered and perplexed because we don't want to make anyone uncomfortable. But I just don't see that in the Bible anywhere. I don't see in the Bible where it's mine and Kelly's job, like God called us to ministry so you could be comfortable. No, if God shows up, you'll probably be bewildered. You'll probably be a little bit perplexed and go, hmm, that's different. There's nothing wrong with that. Kelly and I, our church is almost 10, and there's not been one time in our services or in any meeting where anything weird has happened, but it's been very genuine and Holy Spirit-led. They said, what can this mean? But others in the crowd ridiculed them. There's always going to be haters. There's always going to be predispensationalists who think the gifts have ceased, who are pointing fingers at you with the armchair quarterback blog 
who don't tithe or serve but have a lot of opinions. Then Peter stepped forward. They said, yeah, they're just drunk, just a bunch of weirdos in a cafeteria. If they were a real church, the building would be there. And Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. I love, I love Peter. This is the same dude who said, I don't know Jesus. I don't know Jesus. I don't know Jesus. It's the same one. And now everyone's like, man, a bunch of drunk, crazy people. They need to be in the synagogue reading the Torah, and they need to, they, the, this is how we really, we really do it. I can't believe they would mock God like that, or like it doesn't make sense and it doesn't feel right. And then Peter, defending the move of God, got up and shouted. I think it's about time that a church with genuine theology stand up and shout to the liars and the naysayers and get the attention of the crowd. Get their attention. And he doesn't do it mean. He said, these people aren't drunk like you're assuming. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. It's way too early for that. No, what you see was predicted a long time ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, he says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Anyone in the room glad that his spirit is being poured out onto all people? It would be a disservice to you for me to narrow down all of the breath of God, all of the refreshing of the spirit, all of the baptism of the Holy Spirit to one spiritual gift of speaking in tongues. It would be a disservice to the Holy Spirit to narrow down the magnitude of the power of the Holy Spirit to one spiritual gift that even Paul said is the least of all of them. And I, I want to make very clear to you a few things today. Do we believe in the spiritual gift of speaking in tongues? Yes. Is it powerful? Yes. Do I do it? Yes, every day. I'm praying in tongues on the front row more than I'm singing the songs they're singing. Why? Because my spirit needs to be encouraged. The Bible says that it uplifts the believer, brings confidence and power to the believer. 1 Corinthians 14, 2, he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. And there's two different manifestations of tongues. One is for public and one is for private. You don't hear me yelling it because I don't want you to hear it. It ain't for you. Is there a difference? Yes, there is. The Bible tells us in several places that we should make use of this ability as often as possible. 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, Jude. It also tells us many ways that it benefits the person because it's meant for communication between you and the Lord. And here is the biblical bottom line. As people who are truly filled with the Holy Spirit, you will begin to exhibit the fruits of the Spirit. I didn't say gifts, the fruits of the Spirit, which are what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I knew a lot of people who spoke in tongues, but they were meaner than a rat snake. And I'm like, I just don't know if you really are for real. I think you just shabbat all over the place and just made it up. Because it's hard, it's hard for me to understand how you can be so mean, spirited, and judgmental and hateful, but we get in a room, now you want a tamarind and a flag, and you're yelling. I just don't get it. And I think that there is a peace in the room when the Holy Spirit comes in, not anger. And so we wanted to help reset some of the bad theology maybe you and I have digested over the last couple of decades People's lives that are truly filled by the Holy Spirit will be characterized by a zeal for the Lord. That means you are just in love with Jesus. You'll begin to exhibit the fruits of the Spirit. You'll boldly proclaim truth. See, Peter, that's the first time. Peter went from a timid dude hiding and lying. Peter wasn't at Golgotha's hill. Peter wasn't there when Jesus was crucified. 
They're, 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 he, the dude was hiding for his life, and then he has an experience with the Holy Spirit, and now he's standing on top of a box going, hey, these people ain't drunk. It's 9 o'clock. Let me tell you what did happen to them. The Holy Spirit gives you boldness to speak when a few months before you would have never noticed you doing that, never would have dreamed you'd do that. You have a holiness that begins to take place in your life. And by the way, the word holiness doesn't mean, oh, his holiness. That's not what that means. The word holiness means you are every day getting one step closer and that you treat certain things as holy. That's why we, we don't use the Lord's name in vain or we, we honor the house of God. We don't treat this place as common. This isn't a school right now. This is a sanctuary. We treat it as the house of God because God is here. Does anybody believe that? Paul encourages all believers to continually seek to be filled with the Spirit in Ephesians 5. So that's what we're going to do. As a church, we're going to seek to be filled. And we're going to do our part. And we're going to let the Spirit do what He wills in our lives. But make no mistake, it's okay for people to be bewildered. It's okay for people to be perplexed. So today I want us, though, to focus on the condition of the people that were in the upper room. Okay, so now that we got the whole speaking in tongues thing demystified, you feel better? Everyone take a deep breath. Now we demystified the whole thing that's gotten confused by Christian television. Let's all breathe. And let's really get to what happened in the upper room. Let's really get to what happened there about the condition of the people. Not what happened to them. We just read it. It's a fact. It's, it's black and white. We just read it. Easy to understand. Not what happened to them, but why did it happen to them? And then we're going to show you the work, the force that's at work against you as you seek out the spirits filling in your life. Remember, Jesus' command to them was do not depart, but go to Jerusalem and wait I got to go, but y'all go to Jerusalem and wait. It's a simple instruction, and they did it. Not so easy to do, though, I'd imagine. It's, imagine if Jesus is like, hey, call your boss and say, I can't come in today. I'm using one of my PTO days, maybe all of them. I'm not sure, because Jesus said, go sit in this room and wait for me. Jesus disappeared into the sky, boss. I'm not lying. He went up into the sky. Two old dudes said, welcome, and the cloud shut. So I'm sitting here waiting. They told me to hang out here until something happens. We read the Bible sometimes like the disciples didn't have lives. We read the Bible sometimes like they didn't have families and responsibilities. I think they were probably busier than you and I were. We just turn on the faucet and get water. They had to go find it and then hoof it back to the house. Like just to get, everything took longer. I think life was harder. The average lifespan of a male at that time was 30s and 40s. Life was hard. And when we're, we're seeing what they went through, all of their efforts were to sustain them, not for hobbies or time killers. So for, for Jesus to say, go to Jerusalem and wait, that was a big ask. Simple words, hard to do, but guess what they did? They did it. They obeyed. But it's, it's, they obeyed Jesus, though, get this, even when it was inconvenient, when it was uncomfortable, when it was sacrificial. I imagine that they just wanted to go home. They just wanted to go home. They just wanted to sleep in their own bed. You ever been on a long trip and you just want to go to your bed because for some reason, hotels can't figure out how to make anything comfortable ever. And you just, you just want to go to your own bed with your own sounds and your own smells, even as bad as they might be, depending on your children or spouse. They just want to go back to your own home. It was inconvenient, sacrificial, uncomfortable, but they obeyed. It's my observation and my experience in the last 20 years that Christians are oftentimes Christian spiritual asthmatics. Now, I have asthma. I've had it since I was born. Every car we own, every bag I carry, I got a blue inhaler in every room I go to. They're hiding all over the place. As a kid, 
I should probably have one in my pocket just in case. As a kid, I had to go to the hospital about seven times. We'd wake up in the middle of the night turning blue. Like, not like, oh, I've got asthma. Like, no, like legit, you're going to die, kid. We've got to get you to the hospital. It happened multiple times, over and over and over. And I remember how scary that was. And one time I, I don't know why, but I wanted to play soccer. You know, it's a really great idea for an asthmatic. So I wanted to play, play soccer. And um, so in playing soccer out in West Texas, we're just kicking up dirt because there's no grass. And so it was just dirt all in your face all the time. And I remember they had us running. To our our warm-up for soccer practice was two miles. And they'd have us run two miles. And I started, on, I, you can feel it. Like, when you, you, you know your body, and you know, like, when you're about to get a nosebleed, you're like, mm. you can feel it. You can feel it when your back's about to twinge. You can feel it, you know, when I could feel it, I could feel it closing up. And I was like, oh, no. So I ran over to my coach, and I, and I was trying to get the words out, but I couldn't get the words out. And he started, like, ridiculing me and was like, you don't need it. Get back in line. In fact, run an extra lap. And I, and I was trying to get back over there, and I hit my knees. And another parent in the parking lot knew me. My parents weren't there. They had a blue inhaler. Praise God for rando blue inhalers and vans all over America. This spiritual angel of a mother jumped out of her uh, Dodge Grand Caravan and ran over to me and brought me back to life. And that coach was no longer my coach. There was something around me that was closing my air supply, and I needed breath. I needed someone to help me, and thank God someone did. The suffocation was relieved because someone helped me. I was able to breathe again, take my next step again, play the next game because someone got out of their comfort zone and helped me. The small group roster is live today. Some of you are suffocating. Some of you are little eight-year-old landing. Like, how you doing, brother? <laughs> you think you're fooling everybody, but I can see your soul through your eyes. I know you're lying. I know you can't breathe. I know you cussed out your spouse when you pulled into the parking lot. I know your kids are in there telling everybody in the kids' church what you said to them in the car. I can my kids do. <laughs> it's like, I, 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 know, I know what life feels like and how suffocating it can be. And without somebody to jump out and help you, you may not make it. Small groups aren't here because we want you to have more stuff to do. Our, two of our boys are playing football. Kalen's in cross country. We've got a lot of stuff to do. We don't want to get, but you need, guess what doesn't give me life? Watching practice. Watching football practice, great. Glad, glad y'all are having fun. But I don't sit there and feel spiritually energized by watching my kids play a game. I feel good as a daddy, but I don't spiritually get encouraged. It's, some, it's for their development, not mine. And I, I gotta have people in my corner that can tell when I can't breathe. That can tell when I need my Holy Ghost albuterol. That anointed albuterol. How many more can I make up? Now nah, I'll stop. But they start next week. Roster's live today. Pick one to start with. Our goal, our percentage goal of participation for small groups is 110%. That means all of you and your unsafe friends or the people that say they go to church and never do, the de-churched friends you have are coming with you to group. It's 110%. So everybody get in a group. I don't have time. Make time. Because you might suffocate before you figure out you need it. Let me talk to you about the wind of God, the breath of God, the anointed Adderall, the very good Ventolin, the breathing treatment of the Lord, the nebulizer of heaven. <laughs> <laughs> we need the breath of God. Anybody? 
we should want the wind of God. And that's the Holy Spirit. In Greek, it's the hagias pneuma. Pneuma is breath. It's where we get, it, it comes from, most of English, a lot of English comes from Greek. Pneuma is where we get the word pneumatic. So when you go to discount tire, you're, you're, you're inflating your tires at home, and you've got, you know, one of those um, uh, compressors. It's a pneumatic compressor. It's this wind that gets bottled up and put into something else. We need the holy breath of God. It's, the, it's literally the Father, the Son, and the violent breath of God. But that sounds weird. So in the Bible, we just say Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is always likened to a wind. In Acts 2, throughout the Old Testament, the wind of God, the breath of God, it's always characterized by wind, by breath, by a blast of wind. And wind is powerful. Wind is powerful. Meteorologists can almost be blown over when reporting in a hurricane. And I never understood why they have to go down there. Like you're getting the microphone wet. Like I guess it just gets our attention more. But they're like, it's getting really windy out here, Bob. And they're like, hairs all over the place. You're like, just go. Why? Do you get in hazard pay? It's not, not nice. The wind has the power to knock you over. It has the power to move things, create things, destroy things. Did you know about 30 feet above the ground, wind is always moving, even if you don't feel it down here? Meteorologists can even tell you when the windiest day of the year is and when the calmest day of the year is. By the way, the windiest day of the year is December 31st. The calmest day of the year is September 8th, about the time in South Texas where we desperately need a breeze. It's the calmest, windy wind day of the year. A tailwind, pilots flying from west to east, you pick up a lot of miles per hour, save a lot of fuel because the wind is coming from the west most of the year. But there are some months where the wind comes from the east, and that's July through August. October through February 16th, There's very clear patterns and predictability of the wind, and a lot of times it's coming from the northwest. Look at John 3, 8. The wind blows where it wants to, and you can hear the sound of it, but you don't know where the wind is coming from or where it's going. It is the same with every person who is born of the Spirit. We cannot comprehend or control the Spirit, but we can experience His effect. Wind, if you do a study of it in the Bible, it's very eye-opening. An east wind is described as the wind of judgment. Joseph had a dream of cows going from fat to skinny. It was a prediction uh, for famine for seven years, and there was an east wind that came and blew through the land. The plagues came in Egypt. The locusts and all of that came from the east wind and brought the judgment of God. Hosea 13 says, the east wind will come and all of your fountains will become dry. An east wind shows an upheaval, a removal. And we think God has left us when we have seasons in our life of an east wind. But guess what? God uses the east wind too. A west wind comes from the sea and it it signifies a changing wind. It's a seasonal change in your life. Um, Statistically, our first cold front in Texas is September 16th. I'm just loving all this geeky meteorology stuff I get to use today. I'm living both dreams in one moment. If I had a hurricane to track right here, I might might pass out. I might need some albuterol. A south wind is described as a warm wind. Job 37, you who feel the wind of his voice even now are the same one whose clothes are hot to the touch. When God makes the land go still beneath the south wind. We all know what that feels like right now. Luke 12, when the south wind is blowing, you say, it's going to be hot. And it is. I just love the Bible. It's so hilarious. Does anyone else think this is funny? Do y'all read the Bible like really boringly? Because it's hilarious. It's going to be hot. Yeah, it is. This is proof that God likes to go to cafes and drink coffee and read the newspaper and talk about the weather. This is what this is. That's why my Sabbaths look like that. And when the south wind is blowing, it's going to be hot. You know what's, what it is? You know when that season comes into your life, it's predictable. You know what it's going to feel like. 
You know what it's going to feel like. You and I don't go into June and July and August in South Texas going, hope it's a cold one. You know you might die. And you prepare for it. It's predictable. Like the high pressure system that's set over us for weeks. You wake up in the morning, there's the sun. You go to bed at night, it's 87 degrees. Calm winds. You've got options, though, with predictability. None of you have checked the weather for the last six weeks to plan your plans. Why? Because you know. You know what it's going to be like. You've got options, the river, the lake, the movies, yard work, parties, barbecues, whatever. You've got options. It's predictable. Then there's the the north wind. It's a cold wind. Seasons of life where it feels destructive, where a cold north wind hits your life and you feel like everything is falling apart. What's happening? I feel like every, my life is falling apart. Honey, what are we going to do? And what's my point? God works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God will use the north, the south, the east, and the west wind to purify you, to sanctify you, and draw you nearer to him. And part of your spiritual maturity and your emotional growth and your emotional maturity growth is discerning the seasonal wind that you're in right now and cooperating with God in it and seeing where he is in the wind. Just after a major breakthrough in Europe, As a businesswoman named Lydia, it says she opened her heart to the Lord to respond to the word spoken by Paul. And her her entire family was saved, and they were all baptized. After that, you'd think they're on cloud nine, right? Like, oh my gosh, like our first convert in Europe, like, you know, let's, let's get Jerusalem's worship album out here. Let's do some concerts. You know, let, let's, let's rent out Spain's uh, facilities. Let's, let's put posters everywhere. No, you think they'd be on cloud nine? No, actually, Paul and Silas were on their way to pray for their next steps. So Lydia gets saved. Her whole family gets saved. And this lady was a boss lady. We preached a sermon on her a few uh, years, months ago. I don't remember when, but she was a boss lady, multimillionaire boss lady. Gets saved, her whole family gets saved. Europe is set on fire because of one woman. By the way, if you listen to any preacher who thinks only dudes can do it, they have bad theology, run. Somebody, all the women should have said amen to that a little louder. Come on, ladies. I got your back up here. Don't leave me up here hanging, ladies. Come on. Let me try again. By the way, if you listen to any preachers who think that men can only preach, they have bad theology and you should run. Better, better. Paul and Silas are on their way to pray for their next steps. So you think it'd be a great season of victory? Actually, here's what happened. Enter the next lady. As we were on our way to pray, we were met by a slave girl who was possessed by a spirit of divination, claiming to foretell future events and discover hidden knowledge. So like, you know, when you drive by and you see like the tarot card, psychic lady, voodoo woman, whatever. She brought her owners a lot of money with her lies. She kept following Paul and the rest of us by shouting loudly, these men are the servants of the most high God. They announce to you the way of salvation. I don't see the problem. And she did this for many days. Then Paul, being sorely annoyed and worn out, turned to the spirit within her and said, I charge you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And the spirit of divination came out of her at that very moment. The word divination in Greek is literally the word python. I don't know if you've ever been to the snake farm. Anyone been to the snake farm in New Braunfels? Raise your hand if you have. Let me see. Did anyone have nightmares? Raise your hand if you had nightmares. Okay, me and a couple of my friends. I don't like snakes. I don't like reptiles. Like, Levi had a corn snake in our house. I'm like, he's mean. I got to put dead little mice in here. He stinks. I can't hug him. 
You named him Fang? Like, there's nothing cool about this. But Joey, he's so lovable, little doggy. Nothing cool about snakes. But I will tell you, going, through this, going to the snake farm, they had this giant python constrictor. I mean, brother was big, hundreds of pounds. And we got there at feeding time. The food was live. <laughs> I've never seen something more violent in my life. And I've seen Gladiator a hundred times, Braveheart, Passion of the Christ. I've seen all of them. And this cut me to my core. <laughs> and I was like, oh God, why would y'all put, why would y'all let children see this? I was so concerned, and Levi's like, awesome. <laughs> Dad, look at the eyeballs on that thing. He's about, he's about to get it good, Dad, watch. I'm like, dude, you need deliverance. <laughs> See, a python gets around its prey. You, don't, you might think it's circling you and saying hello but it's just getting the lay of the land to see how dumb you are, how lazy you are, how lukewarm spiritually you are, to see if you've got any spiritual discernment at all, to know you're being encircled by death. And then it gets higher. By the time it gets to the point where you're like, oh no, it's too late. And I think sometimes our Christian walk feels constricted. We try to move forward and we find ourselves stagnant and backsliding. That's an old Baptist word for you quit coming to church. Constriction is narrowing, tightening, asphyxiation, being deprived of oxygen, which can result in unconsciousness and death. The python spirit constricts and tightens around the most vital parts of life to make it difficult to breathe and then eventually unable to breathe at all. You and I have to be alert. You know what I think is interesting about this? Paul and Silas knew what was, they knew this young woman and even though she, remember she was shouting the right words. Y'all remember what she was saying? Follow these men. They know the way to God. They know Jesus. They know salvation. Follow these men. Just kept following them around like, just like, a, like a chihuahua at their heels. But there was a, the Holy Spirit in them began to discern that even though you're following me and you're saying the right words, what I feel is not the same. And there was a discernment there to realize that a constrictor was following them, trying to choke out the hearers of the word. Paul and Silas knew the words were right, but it wasn't from the right spirit. But remember, the last week we taught you that when Jesus introduced the Holy Spirit to us, he didn't call him the Holy Spirit. He called him the Spirit of Truth. With the spirit of truth, they were baptized by the spirit of truth. He was no longer just around them. The Holy Spirit is in them. And when the spirit of truth in them came into contact with something that sounded right, but why am I annoyed? It wasn't because Paul and Silas were just frustrated old dudes. They were like, Some, something doesn't feel right. And too many times, I have not trusted that feeling, and it's not gone well. If you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit and something doesn't feel right, there's something not right in the room. And you have to discern what's going on. And this happened like a year ago, I think maybe two years ago. I happened to be at the office um, at our midweek campus on 1518. The worship team rehearses there, and we, there was a worship rehearsal, and I just kind of got get to sneak in the room and and I said, "Hey, what's going on in here?" None of them had divination, no no pythons playing keyboards, nothing like that. But one by one all of them started to weep. 
and the devil had been attacking them at night. They had all been having some of the same dreams and nightmares of suicide and death. So we handled that sucker right then and there. We didn't rehearse very much at all, but we prayed and it got loud. And since there were a lot of believers, we just spoke in tongues as loud as we wanted. So there's any unbelievers in the room, so it got to happen a little different, but the, the spirit in the room has to be handled. It has to be dealt with. So I think we need to be alert. So you want some of the warning signs of spiritual attack as we get ready to end? Number one, a lack of spiritual desire. You lose the want to. You lose the want to. David says, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you, meaning I'm thirsty and the only thing that can quench it is the spirit. Python doesn't kill its victims instantly. It's little by little it puts the squeeze on. And before you know it, you don't want to go to church. You don't have an interest in reading the word. And all of the things that we need to do to stay alive spiritually, we begin to neglect. Number two, old sins and habits resurface. You begin to pick up things and engage in things that you used to be free from. And one thing I noticed in the passage is that Paul and Silas didn't cast it out of her as soon as they met her. But the Bible tells us they, they knew. Can I tell you this is what I think the Lord wants us to know about that? You can walk with the enemy as long as you want to. You can walk with the enemy as long as you want. And you know he's there. And you'll put up with his, you'll put up with it. You'll put up with him circling you. You'll put up with all of this. You know He's there, but we don't do anything about it. And when I get to heaven, when people go, what is the question you want to ask God when you get to heaven? I get questions like that all the time. I'm like, I'm going to ask Paul and Silas, why didn't you handle the crazy lady when you first saw her? And they're probably going to go, so you could have a scripture to read. Whatever. You didn't know that, Paul. I can't wait to ridicule the disciples. It's going to be so fun. (laughs) They could have kept walking. They were trying to ignore it, finding coping mechanisms to keep her around. Hoping that the Maverick City music is louder than the yapping. The enemy never comes with a bold-faced lie. It's always masked with half-truth. She didn't say anything wrong. She was wrong. What was in her was wrong. What was in her was evil. Finally, Paul got annoyed and worn out. Are there any annoyed and worn out people in here? Are there any people in here that are sick and tired of feeling sick and tired? You're going to church, you're serving, and you're wondering why you're still not full of joy. There's a python around you somewhere. You can walk in addiction. You can sin, be with the wrong people. You can have a job that's killing your peace, killing your marriage, have negative thought patterns that are destroying your emotional stability, or even something sneakier that sounds like God, sounds like honor, sounds helpful, sounds true, but your spirit feels weaker and your emotions feel louder. You can walk with that type of life day after day. Remember what the Bible said, you can walk with it for many and many days, but I'm believing that you are greatly annoyed and worn out and you're tired of walking with this nonsense, and you're ready to do what the Bible said Paul did, turn around and speak to it. Is anyone ready to turn around and speak to it? Is anyone tired of walking with all of the bondage and the weight and the struggle and the tiredness, and you're ready to turn around and say, I'm tired of this aggravation in our marriage. What's going on? So instead of like cohabitating and pretending like everything's fine, you're, you're tired of, you're, t- you're annoyed and you're worn out and you're going to turn around and say, I'm not saying you're the devil, but he's in our house somewhere. I want to find it. Do you want to find it? Yeah. Now we're on the same page. I don't like you right now, but I love you. Grab my hand. We're going to walk room to room and find the devil. And he might be on your phone. You're walking around finding the devil. He's like, he's still with me because you still have porn on your phone. You put Python in your pocket and you expect there to be intimacy in your marriage. There's Python in your home somewhere and it's never gonna change if you don't wanna ruffle the feathers. And I don't like there not being peace in the room, but I got sick and tired 
of the python walking behind me, and I do have a little bit of a poke the bear personality, so I'm like, what the heck? Like, it's biblical, Paul, you know, there's cuss words in the Bible, whatever. Raka! Like, it's in here somewhere. Where's, where's python at? Where is he? He's somewhere. Now, before you go pay a counselor thousands of dollars you didn't budget, do that first. Go find a counselor and all that later, but you deal with the spiritual stuff first. Well, then that feels really weird. We don't even hold hands now. I don't care. <laughs> Just, you grab their hand and walk around and you find where he is. Is anyone done with the annoyances, the struggle? We need the Holy Spirit in us, not just around us. So what do we do? The key to spiritual vitality is prayer and surrender. So simple. Remember what Paul and Silas were going to do when the woman with divination came and found them? They were on their way to what? Pray. That's when the spirit of Python attacked them. The enemy doesn't want you taking spiritual steps. The enemy doesn't want you to scan the QR code for small groups. The enemy doesn't want you to go to growth track because he knows that if you find out that you were created on purpose for a purpose, then you'll know his purpose and you'll send him to his eternal purpose. He knows that. So if he can see, keep you distracted and frustrated and aggravated, the enemy doesn't want you taking spiritual steps, so he'll choke it out when he gets the chance. And I think that the greatest tragedy of prayerlessness is the unemployment of angels. Jesus prayed and an angel came and it encouraged him and ministered to him. Even Jesus needed an angel to encourage him. Paul prayed on a ship in the middle of the storm and God sent a standby angel. And I think of it like this, there's angels that are just ready and they're waiting. Like one of the Texas Longhorns linebackers yesterday with Colorado State, just ready to pound you to the ground. Ready. And when you pray, they're unleashed. Anybody remember the old song? I believe there are angels among us. As creepy as that song is, it's still true. Thank you, Caleb. <laughs> Spiritual attacks generally happen right after a great victory. How many of you, you got baptized in this church and you felt like a north wind came? after a great victory, after a great date night, after a great breakthrough, the python was like the forked sensors on the tongue of the snake can sense its prey. The spirit of python knows where to find you. And we gotta understand when the enemy's hitting us and we were built to outlast the storm, everybody. The wise man built his house upon the rock. Jesus knew you'd be here today. And Jesus already knew what you'd be going through when you came here today. He knew the diagnosis was coming. He knew the financial storm that was coming. But if we pray and ask the Holy Spirit to fill us, you will come through the storm and release the suffocation of Python's coils. And angels will be released to encourage and minister you, minister to you while the Holy Spirit leads and guides you. Does anybody want that today? Go ahead and stand to your feet. As the Bible says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Not by might, not my own will, not my own way but by my spirit, Zechariah 4, 6. There's something powerful about realizing that you don't have it in you to do it on your own power. You have to have the Holy Spirit. That's how you get breakthrough. That's how you get your vitality back. And I'm afraid that even in our churches, the enemy wants us to be so programmatic and so professional that we miss the missing ingredient the breath of God, the wind of God. And I don't know about you, but I don't want the Holy Spirit to be choked out in my life. I don't want the Holy Spirit to be asked to leave our services, so we hope you come back. We 
please come back. Too many church staff meetings are like that. Forget that. How about we ask the Holy Spirit to come? God knew you'd be here. We'll let God do whatever he wants to do. You're his kid anyway, not ours. So we'll let God handle that and all your questions. And we're just going to keep asking the Holy Spirit to fill you. I need the Holy Spirit. We learned about him through the word of God. Reading God's word is like inhaling. Prayer is exhaling. It keeps you alive. I need the Holy Spirit. Anybody else? We're going to end our service this way today for the sake of time. We, um, we had kid dedications and all that. It was so beautiful. I want to end the service in a little bit of a different way. I'm going to pray over every one of us that, that you'll stay in your seat. Um, but at the end of the service, the prayer team will be down here at the front if someone wants further prayer. And the Holy Spirit wants to fill you. But the Holy Spirit filling you comes after you've made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. So we're going to honor the Lord. We're going to do two things. Now, I was thinking about this on the drive over here, and it just kind of feels confirmed. We're all going to take communion. If you've made Jesus your Lord and Savior, you're going to come take communion. And then you're going to go back to your seat, and you're going to start asking the Holy Spirit to fill you. Nobody's going to touch you. There's nothing weird going to happen. There's no modesty clause in the corner. There's no boxes with reptiles. You're all going to be okay. Remember, the Holy Spirit's not weird. People are weird. So you're going to come and take communion. You're going to go back to your seat, and you're going to start worshiping as the band sings. And we're going to end the service asking the Holy Spirit to fill us. And that's all you got to say is, Holy Spirit, fill me. So God, in this moment, communion partners, go ahead and get to your place. Holy Spirit, have your way. Everybody hold your hands in the air and just begin to surrender to the Lord in this moment. Holy Spirit, have your way. So God, if there's anybody who needs to make Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior, we declare right now that you are our Savior. You are our Lord. Father, forgive us of our sin. If this is for you, receive it for you. Forgive me of my sin. Come and make me clean. Wash me white as snow. Remove the guilt, the stain of guilt and regret, and God, fill me with your joy and peace by the power of your Son, Jesus. And Holy Spirit, fill me. In Jesus' name. Everybody come, and you go ahead, and you'll get in line. It might take a little while, but that's okay. You go ahead and get in line, and then when you're done with communion, you start to ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. And then Kelly and I will come up in the service here shortly.